I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, tonight class on logic. I uh, just want to say that, uh, you know, logic is extremely important in understanding the Bible and indeed in, in everything that we do uh, day by day. All of us use logic and a lot of the concepts that uh, we will study, you, you already use them. What you haven't done, uh, perhaps, to date is formalize your um, analysis of logic or have given the various and sundry aspects of it a name, but you still use it. You can't get fired without using it. Even those who say that uh, you, know, you can't trust logic will have to use logic to assert that you can't trust logic, which is illogical. So uh, we'll just ignore them and go ahead and be logical. Before we uh, begin, though, let's have a uh, short word of prayer. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are so uh, pleased that we can gather this evening by this manner in order to engage in a study that will allow us to better ascertain but thou would have us to know of thy word, for we know that it is the gospel that is the means for our eternal salvation. And may each of us be diligent students of thy word and be able to teach others also. So bless us as we engage in this study and bless us in everything that is right and defeat us in evil so that we may be better servants of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who died for us and shed his blood that we might be cleansed from our sins. In his name we pray. Amen. I'm going to attempt this again to share screen. I think I've got it figured out now. Uh, And it says I'm screen sharing. What we uh, covered uh, last week, uh, we went over this, but I want to go over it again. And this is from uh, Brother Warren's book, uh, Logic in the Bible. But it just need to reemphasize the things that were said there. And we'll, we'll go into some other uh, authors who have also written on the subject. And there's a ton of information out there on, on a, a formalized study of logic. But uh, he says here, uh, down in, under item one, that logic has to do with the relationship between or among propositions, uh, which uh, uh, function as premises. And, you know, when we get into syllogism, we'll have a major premise and a minor premise. And those which uh, function as conclusions. And if you have a um, valid syllogism, the conclusion has to follow the major and minor premise. It doesn't may mean it's true. Uh, it may be a false uh, syllogism, but it uh, can still be valid. And we, we'll cover that eventually also. But when we get into propositions, uh, these are things that are uh, somewhat serving as evidence. And we, you know, we may call them premises. Or, but it's a statement. It says something that either is or is not the case. It says it in a, in a formal way. In the uh, Proposition may be categorical, and we're going to get that a little, little bit later. Uh, there, there are two types, categorical and propositional. But a categorical statement just says that something is or is not the case. It didn't specify any conditions about it. It just says it is or isn't. And, and, and so the entire category is either uh, true or it isn't true, one or the other. Yeah, the proposition is uh, can be hypothetical. Uh, it may state 
that if one thing is the case and another thing would be the case, you know, it follows logically. Uh, proposition may be disjunctive. If you think of disjoined, uh, you know, you kind of get the idea what disjunctive is. And it can state that either uh, one thing is the case or another thing is the case. And a proposition may be conjunctive, conjoined, if you will, in that it may state that both are uh, two propositions, you know, or you can have more, two propositions are true. And when you get into uh, logic, you, you talk about an argument, you know, it being engaged in an argument. Now, the popular uh, conceptualization of an argument is, you know, you you get two people who are mad at, they're discussing some subject, either uh, politics or religion or something like that. And one's asserting one thing, one's asserting another thing, and they get mad at each other and they yell at each other. And what, in, in, in logic, that is not what an argument is. That's a, uh, most likely is a verbal dispute. An argument is uh, comprised of a number of propositions, premises, you remember? Uh, some of these propositions serve as premises, which also serves as evidence for the conclusion that we're going to draw. And one or more of these propositions uh, serve as a conclusion. And the conclusion must follow logically from the premises. It does mean that the, uh, the conclusion is true because if the uh, one or both premises are false and the conclusion is false, but it may be a logical or a valid uh, uh, syllogism. So the conclusion has to logically Using the, uh, we'll use the, the uh, what we call the laws of thought to arrive at that. But it have to, they have to logically follow from the premises, and they will, provided that the uh, argument is a valid argument, in which uh, if it's valid, then the premises uh, also have to be true. You got to have a valid argument, and the premises have to be true. And if the conclusion logic, uh, follows logically from the premises, both premises are true, then the conclusion has to be true. So an argument uh, is discourse, you know, conversation back and forth, communication back and forth, uh, which contains an implication. There are explicit things said in the uh, premises, major and minor premises, and there's an implication that uh, follows into the conclusion. And uh, the, the proper reaction provided again, if the uh, argument is valid and the premises are true, the proper reaction to the argument is to say, this is true, the conclusion is true. Oh, well, validity, let's, let's talk about validity, validity for a moment. Uh, validity is to say that the conclusion is implied by the premises. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means it's implied by the uh, premises. So if the uh, uh, premises are true, then if it's a valid argument, then the conclusion is demanded. This is follows, just uh, as light, uh, night follows day. It just follows from the uh, premises. So the conclusion must be true also if the premises are true. Uh, and Brother Warren says here that an argument being valid does not guarantee that the premises are true or that the conclusion is true. It just has the, the valid form of a syllogism. That's, that's all it's saying. So an argument can be valid <clears throat> even though all the premises are false and the conclusion is false. And if we gave this example before, all Fords are green, that's a major premise. All, I meant all cars are Fords. 
and then all fours are green. That's a minor premise. Now, if one and two are true, then the conclusion is that all cars are green. And that's right, if one and two are, are true. That makes it a valid argument. But you know, we can see that this is not a true argument. It's a false uh, uh, conclusion because of the one and two are uh, wrong. Both of them are wrong. If only one of them is wrong, that, that's enough. <clears throat> so when you talk about, uh, and this is a categorical syllogism, not a, not a propositional, but uh, no one rule of the categorical syllogism is, is broken by this argument. Yeah, you, you can see that both uh, premises are false. But like I say, if only one's false, I don't care what the conclusion is, the conclusion is false. So it's the case uh, here that the conclusion is not uh, proved by, you know, logically, uh, uh, logically from the, the premises, even though it's a valid argument. So to say, uh, we, we, so we need to talk about soundness, you know, we, we can talk about validity, but we also need to talk about soundness. And that's uh, usually what we say is true or not true. So soundness is to say that uh, both, these two conditions have to be present, both the argument is valid and the, the uh, example given above, the argument is valid and that all the premises are true, but all the premises of the above example are not true. So if it's the case that the argument is not valid, for example, the uh, conclusion doesn't logically follow from the premises, that's one case. Or if one, just one of the premises is not true, then it's not a sound argument. We can't uh, rely upon it to teach truth. Only sound arguments uh, which are derived from true or valid arguments. Only sound arguments prove their conclusions to be true. Now, Brother Warren in, in item six says to say that a, a certain proposition is taught explicitly <clears throat> uh, is to say that the proposition is stated in just so many words in the Bible, uh, we can say, you know, Jesus is Lord, uh, something to that effect. Uh, he gives, gives the example here that the proposition, except one be born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That's explicitly stated. I mean, he used the American Standard Version, of course. Uh, you know, you may use the King James or the uh, New King James, but that's an explicitly stated uh, uh, statement. It's a statement, explicit. But the proposition, <clears throat> no man can enter into the church which Jesus bought with his own blood without being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, is not explicitly stated in the Bible, even though it is taught implicitly. And those things taught implicitly uh, are just as valid. Uh, again, if you if it's a, a valid uh, argument and a sound argument. <clears throat> <clears throat> to say that a proposition is taught implicitly by explicit statement is to say that it is impossible for the uh, given explicit statements to be true. And yet the proposition which is implied to be false. So we say that uh, uh, proposition A implies proposition B, and it doesn't matter what those propositions are for the moment, is to say that it is impossible for proposition, proposition A to be true and proposition B to be false. If A implies B and B is, uh, A is true, that implies B is true. 
So this means you have two propositions or statements, and we'll, we'll get into statements uh, later. If two propositions are related to each other in such fashion that the second proposition must be true, if the first one is true, that the second one follows from the first, if it does follow from the first, or it means that the second one is a logical consequence of the first one. It logically follows from the first one. So if the first one is true, the second one is true. So in this case, the first one, the first proposition serves as, as evidence. And of course, when we get the, the, the formal uh, declaration of the terms, we'll, we'll say a premise, major premise or minor premise. And the second one serves as a conclusion. And, uh, and Brother Warren does uh, cover this in greater detail in chapter five and chapter eight, which we'll get to in time. <clears throat> and to say that the uh, proposition is true or statement <clears throat> is to say that it correctly describes reality. And if it doesn't, then it's just fantasy is all it is. <clears throat> So to say that a proposition is true is to say that if the proposition says that such and such is the case, and you know we can see from reality that such and such is the case, then the proposition is true. On the other hand, to say that a proposition is false is to say that the proposition says that such and such is the, is the case. But such and such is not the case, uh, then the proposition is false. So truth and falsity uh, relates to proposition and statement. We're talking about state of uh, something. But uh, validity and soundness uh, relate to argument. So when we get to in the study of uh, uh, logic, we're going to have to study statement as well as a validity and, and soundness as it relates to argument. So there, there's a lot uh, of formalization that one must uh, acquire in order to properly understand logic. But like I say again, everybody uses logic. You use logic every day. You can't get by without doing it. <clears throat> and we'll have more to say about that too. But a proposition can neither be valid nor sound, but an argument can be either valid or invalid, sound or unsound. Uh, proposition is just uh, saying that something uh, uh, is true or not true, and, and we'll use logic to, to prove that. So, but the, as he says, uh, strict and uh, strict logical usage. No logic can, can be either true or false. It's just uh, valid or sound. So, what are some objections to uh, logic? Let me get out of this screen and then get get another one. Uh, object, objections to logic. Now this is written by a denominational writer uh, offhand. I don't remember who it is, and you'll see his denominational uh, tendencies come through when we get at the end of this uh, uh, little article that, that he wrote. But for the most part, it's, uh, you know, he has some good, makes some good points. So, and believe me, there are people that, uh, uh, oh, uh, decry our logic and saying that it's, you know, it can lead to false conclusions rather than properly used, it certainly can. But here he says uh, uh, 
some object, object to studying logic. And when it comes to the Bible, they say that, you know, logic just shouldn't be used. And uh, uh, we read uh, something that uh, Brother Warren had, uh, stated about somebody writing in the firm foundation saying that you could only use ex explicit statements. You know, when the uh, statements of the Bible ended and, and when men started uh, uh, saying what is implied and they gone to meddling. Yeah, but that's an illogical statement because that's the case you can never preach a sermon. You can only read from the Bible. So anyway, it says here some theologians revel in paradox and antimony and, and as if we're somehow uh, more spiritual to believe in the, in the absurd, uh, absurd and, then, and I think that's probably true. And he says here, uh, the objections to losing, uh, using logic uh, seem to be based on misunderstandings. I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think uh, by using logic, uh, they arrive at conclusions that they just don't want to accept. Even this writer will do that, and we'll see that in a moment. So some say uh, uh, using logic puts logic before God. He says, no. Uh, we use logic in the process of knowing God. We know God through the Bible, and we must use the logic to understand what the Bible says. It says here that it doesn't mean that God came after logic in reality. Uh, without God, nothing could have existence. And God is the basis of all logic and reality, and he is no way inferior to it. Logic comes from God, but God does not come from logic. Uh, when it comes to, the, uh, to how we know th things, logic is a basis for all thought. That's why I say you use it every day. And it must come before any thought about anything, including God. And he gives an example here. That, you know, you need to map to get to Washington, D.C., uh, but Washington must exist before the map can help me get there. So even so, we use logic first to come to know God. But God exists first before we can know him. And we know that that makes sense. And using logic makes God subject to our logic. Well, it, it isn't our logic. Man didn't invent logic. Uh, we only discovered logic, so where did it come from? Well, God is the author of, of uh, all logic, and we'll see how uh, that uh, how we arrived at that. So technically speaking, God does not flow from logic, logic flows from God. And it isn't God that we examine using logic. It is statements, it is our statements and biblical statements, statements, about God, so no one is trying to uh, judge God. It's our statements that we make about him that we analyze with logic, and we have to use what is written in that analysis. So logic simply provides a way to see if those statements are true and if they fit with the reality of who God really is. So if we make statements about what the Bible says, then we ought to be able to use uh, logic to prove that those biblical statements after saying what we uh, have heard. Finally, in applying logic uh, to those statements, God is not being tested by some standard outside himself. Logic flows from God, and it's part of his uh, rational nature, and we'll, we'll talk about this some, is that uh, uh, did God create logic? And the answer would be uh, no, he didn't create logic like he uh, did the material world. It is an attribute of God. Logic uh, 
uh, defines God. He is logical. He can't be anything but logical. So <clears throat> uh, using logic and theology is simply applying uh, God's test, his innate quality uh, to our statements about him. So we use an attribute of God to test the statements that we are attributing to God. And that's uh, using that aspect, his own attributes, logic. That's how we come to uh, a knowledge of the truth. Of course, we don't really, well, I should say, some people have even a problem with explicit statements. And you see that uh, with all the transgender stuff going on, that they ignore the explicit statements. So if they can ignore the explicit, then they can ignore the implicit also. He says, using logic as a form of uh, rationalism. So being reasonable and, and being a rationalist are, are quite different. Uh, rationalist, he tries to determine all things by reason. Now, reasonable Christians only try to, to discover it. Uh, a rationalist wouldn't let any empirical data change his uh, conclusion. You know, we always use the deal, you know, don't confuse me with the facts. And the rationalist doesn't want to be confused by the, the, uh, the facts. But a reasonable person, one who uses logic, takes account of the facts because that's what's going to prove uh, his conclusions to be uh, true. So he incorporates the facts into his view. And based on his analysis, the fact he, you know, using syllogism or some other aspect of uh, logical analysis, sometimes he'll change his conclusion um, when either new facts become known or he discovers that his analysis of those facts uh, were in error and he comes to a correct, a correct conclusion as what those uh, uh, facts imply. Yeah, some rationalists won't even let the Bible change the conclusions they've reached by uh, reason, and we see that all the time. And but they'll just have to be uh, reasonable, I suppose. So a reasonable person, by contrast, uh, uh, he'll take a contradiction as a sign that his statement about God is wrong. He takes in all what the Bible has to say about a matter and uh, reasons with it correctly and arrives at a conclusion that is contrary to his previously held beliefs. If he's honest, he'll, he'll change his beliefs. Uh, rationalists uh, set the limits of what can be true about God. Reasonable people only use logic to test the truth of their statements about God, and they'll change if they're honest. That is, they'll change when those uh, uh, conclusions prove to be false. So it says the Bible says that God can do the impossible. Uh, so does that mean that He is not bound by a logical limitation? Well, God can do what is humanly impossible, but He can't do uh, that which is actually impossible. Some things are impossible because of our human limitations, such as our walking through walls, raising the dead, being two places at once. But these things are possible for God, who has no body, is a giver of life, you know, is always everywhere. And I think I may have given the example about uh, someone saying that uh, can you jump over the moon. Uh, well, if you can specify that in the jumping you must attain a certain escape velocity from the Earth's gravity and that you can follow a trajectory uh, to the moon that uh, returns you to Earth, 
and not burn up on reentry, yes, then you can jump over the moon. But it's not humanly possible. So there's a human limitation there. Now, is it possible for God to jump over the moon? Well, you know, he doesn't do things that are not necessary. He's, uh, he's everywhere anyway. He's already there. So well, why does he need to jump over anything? So that's, that's a, uh, something that's just uh, not logical. It just, uh, he, he can't jump over something where he already is. So, uh, so he's not subject to human limitation. So th this does not mean that God can literally do anything. He can't lie. Uh, so that which is actually in impossible, he, he can't do. He can't lie. Uh, God can't be tempted. And it's possible for him to, to deny his own uh, oaths or statements or what he says he will do. These things are impossible for a perfect God uh, to do since he's perfectly uh, good and can't do evil. Now, God can't make a square circle because of the definition of what a square is in the circle. He, he can't do it. He can't make a triangle with two sides because of the definition of what a triangle is. And, but neither can anyone else do it. These things can't possibly exist because they're self-contradictory things. When you, when you specify the definition of a circle and a square, you can't make one into the other. So no circle can be a square because squares have four sides and circles don't. It's just part of the definition. All triangles must have three sides. Well, there aren't triangles. Uh, they're impossible ideas. Once you define it, you can't make it into something else. So they're logically impossible. Uh, so that goes with making a, a mountain so big that can, God can't move it. How can anything be uh, too big, as he says, for the infinite God of power to handle? If God can make it, he can move it. Uh, this teaching like this is uh, brought, or brought to one uh, some unusual, uh, unusual responses, and I gave just to give an example about the moon. Uh, if God created the laws of logic, then why can't he break them? After all, he created the laws of nature, and he breaks them every time he does a miracle. But the author here points out that there's a difference between the laws of nature and the laws of logic. Uh, natural law is only a description of how things normally do operate. Doesn't mean they operate that way all the time, but normally do operate. But laws of logic are, um, he said, more like ethical laws. They tell us how our mind should operate. They tell us about the nature of God. And if we don't think that way, that, that's not because of the... Uh, uh, logical laws is because we just ignore them. In this sense, logical laws are prescriptive, uh, calling uh, for our obedience, since we ought to think logically. But natural laws are only descriptive. They don't make any such demand. They don't prescribe anything. They just say this is the way that things should work. Natural laws are only just descriptive. So uh, also logic flaws from God's rational nature. That's what he is. He's rational. He can't change his nature. If uh, he could change his uh, attributes, his nature, then he wouldn't be God. So he, he can't change his nature. It would be uh, like uh, God breaking a moral law, which also flows from the nature. He, he can't do it can you you can't imagine god being unjust or unloving so he can't break his laws of logic either that's just 
what do you? Uh, so don't some doctrines like Trinity, the Trinity, the incarnation of Christ, and predestination involve contradictions? And here, here's here's what gets gets kind of interesting. He asserts that each of these cases it, it can be shown that, that there's no real contradiction involved. Uh, some theologians have used the words like antimony or paradox to describe the problems. Antimony is just is a paradox. Uh, describe the problems encountered with these doctrines, but those are, uh, words imply contradiction. And he goes to say that uh, you know, these are not contradictions that go against reason. He talks about the doctrine of the Trinity and saying that God is uh, three persons, yet only one person. Uh, of course, we know that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit there's just one God. They're all of the same divine essence. So we can say that they're three separate persons, personalities, or what have you, but there's just one God. And so there's no self contradiction in that. <clears throat> we have only seen the one person uh, here on earth of the human nature and the God nature. And that doesn't mean, if we think about that, uh, you remember Jesus, you know, some of the disciples asked uh, Jesus, you know, show us God, you know, he said, well, have you seen me? You've seen the Father. So uh, the doctrine of the incarnation would be self-contradictory. It said that uh, uh, Christ had both the human and divine, divine nature in one nature, but it doesn't say that. He's got a human nature, and he had to have that in order to be a, the appropriate sacrifice for us. He also had, had to have a divine nature because that's the only thing that could uh, uh, satisfy the demand uh, for uh, uh, forgiveness of sin. So, uh, what he is divinely is different from what he is uh, humanly, but he's he's still just one God and man in the same being. Now here's what I thought was a very uh, telling, even though that uh, people that are uh, logicians, if they have a particular doctrine that they uh, have embraced, they must conform their um, analysis, that, that logical analysis of that, to support that uh, doctrine, the doctrine of predestination. And doctrine of predestination says that, you know, that, uh, for example, Calvinist says that God chooses those you're going to be saved. It's not a thing in the world you can do about it. You can't uh, deny it. You can do anything, but you're still going to be saved. Or you can be the best person there ever was. And if you're not one of the elect, it doesn't matter what you do, you're still going to be lost. And uh, there's also the idea of uh, original sin. Everybody has this, uh, are guilty of this original sin. So everybody is lost. Now, only those who have sinned, which includes all accountable persons, those are the ones that are lost. Uh, you know, a, uh, under this idea of predestination, even the baby, newborn baby, can be lost because it's just predestined that they're going to be lost. So this is the idea that this uh, guy, he's got to uphold this in his analysis of logic. So let's, let's just see what he says about it. Predestination uh, also confuses some people, and I think it confuses the author also. As a morally perfect being, God cannot force free people to do what they do not choose to do. Well, we can agree with that. Furthermore, forced uh, freedom is a contradiction. 
Well, if that's the case, then you, you need to follow that uh, logic all the way through your statement. But it is not contradictory for God to determine what people will do with their free choice. And this is the way he uh, uh, defines this by way of explanation. God pre-knows everything that's going to happen. He has predetermined uh, what must be done in order for everyone to be saved. And he know, knows if you'll obey Christ or if you won't. So any, anything that is the object of knowledge, uh, past, present, or future, he knows it already. So what you uh, do with the saving gospel message, he already knows what you will do. But he does not determine ahead of time that you will do one thing or the other. But he, you know, this author is saying uh, it's not contradictory for God to determine. He means uh, to choose for you. It's not contradictory for God to choose what people will do with their free choice. That's what he's saying. But he doesn't want to use those terms. In this way, God can control and determine the choices we make. Well, if he controls and determines, then it's not a free choice. It's not a choice. Uh, we're just uh, robots at that point in time. But he does not force those choices on us. What he does, if he controls and determines the choices, he does force those choices on us. The guy can't get around this. God works persuasively. Well, he, he does. That's the reason we have the gospel to persuade us. And I coercively, he doesn't force you to obey the gospel, but he knows if he will. So we, we still experience our choices as free as our decisions, even though God uh, both knew what we would decide. Yes, he does. And chose that we would decide. He didn't choose that we decide. He just knows what we will decide. He allows us to choose. So he uh, he says here, we, he chose that we would decide it long before we did. Forced freedom is a contradiction. Well, his statement here is a contradiction. Control and determination uh, by God of the choices we make is a force. And uh, yeah, forced freedom is, is a contradiction. But a for, forced choice is what he's saying that God does. It, he says, but God determinately choosing that I make a free choice is not. And that's just a utter nonsense. But it's a good lesson to uh, be careful about uh, what you find from denominational writers because they they hold a particular doctrine and they uh, must in their argument support that denominational doctrine so uh, let's look at some crucial if I can get it up Crucial laws. This is the uh, uh, again from Brother Warren. He said again that uh, logic. Talking about this logic. Uh, logic is reasoning. It's prevented. Uh, it's a uh, in one or more uh, proposition that's evident premises and some other propositions that are, are true. So he says a logical argument takes this uh, form. The proposition is true because those two other propositions are true. In other words, the uh, major premise and the minor premise 
are true, and if the conclusions follow from those, then, then that's true also. So that proves all these uh, propositions, proves the proposition to be true. <clears throat> and he's noted that the, the act of logically moving from the premises of the major premise, minor premise, premise to the conclusion as a valid and sound uh, argument is known as uh, inference. We infer the conclusion from the premises. So the person who reasons from the premises to the conclusion infers what the uh, premises implies. And so there's an important, important difference between implication and inference. Um, we should note that, and we'll get more in, when he gets in his chapter uh, five. It says it should be noted that uh, one may infer from a proposition or proposition, a proposition which is false, but it's impossible for true propositions and a valid argument. Remember what we said, what a, a valid argument was uh, to be to imply that was, which is false. That makes it a sound argument. Well, I see we're already, already going past time here. So I uh, will pick up again with the, uh, the, uh, uh, crucial laws, laws of rationality, and uh, we'll get the, uh, a bit after that the laws of thought, or sometimes probably better to say axioms of thought because of, of exactly what it is. And it's, again, it's things that we use all the time. We just haven't given a formal uh, uh, description or definition to what we just do naturally. So we'll get into that in the uh, later weeks. So appreciate you uh, for being here and your kind attention. Hopefully yeah, we've gained some idea about the way that we operate day by day and operate, and should operate in evaluating uh, the uh, what the Bible has to say to us. Thank you.